Hey guys, Mr. Ellison here with another chapter from Crash. If you remember from last time we left off, uh, Crash just got home, had a pretty rough day, and he realized someone was home and it was Scooter. So this is chapter 19. I don't really have a great-great-grandfather like I told Webb years ago. I don't even have a great-grandfather, but I really do have a grandfather. And his name is Scooter. He used to be a cook in the U.S. Navy. What are you doing here, I said. He waved the spatula. What's it look like, Swabby? Make an octopus stew. I stuck my finger down my throat and pretended to gag. Ah! And then I rushed into him. Hey, Swabby, he said. Why are you squeezing me so hard? He looked around. So where is everybody? Mom and Dad are working, and I don't know where Abby is. I remember the suitcase. You're staying, right? If you haven't sold my old bed, how long? Usually he stays a night or two. Oh, he turned back to the stove. Maybe for good. Yeah, don't I wish. I knew he was kidding, but I hugged him anyways. Just thinking about it, I squeezed his arms and turned him around. Scooter, you should have seen me today. Our first game. I scored six touchdowns. Six. They said it was a single a record for a single game rec uh, they said it was a single game record. His eyes popped. Six? Am I hearing right? Yeah. And they looked they took me out of the third quarter. I was awesome. He gave me a low-key smile. His eyes went back to normal size. It got real soft. He patted me twice on the cheek. You didn't have to score all those touchdowns for me, you know that? The front door opened. I thought it was Abby, but it wasn't. It was my parents. I looked at the clock. It was only 20 minutes after 5. In the kitchen, they hugged Scooter into the ah routine when he told them it was octopus stew. It's a family joke we do when Scooter visits and cooks for us. It's never really octopus, but it's the only thing we know for sure. He makes it up mostly from whatever he finds in the kitchen. So it's always different and always great. My father said, finally, we'll be getting some good food around here. My mom punched him, and she laughed too. She hates to cook. But I was stuck on my dad's words when he said, we'll be getting. Scooter's just coming for a day or two, right? I said, like usual. Silence, stairs bouncing around the kitchen, slow, growing grins. Don't you listen, Swabby? I told you once, maybe for good. Must have looked pretty funny because everybody took one peek at me and burst out laughing. Abby phoned, and she said that she was at a friend's and would be home soon. Scooter said, not soon enough. The eight-arm stew is ready. Everybody sit. My mother pinched her nose and pointed, not till you get that out of here. I ran my football bag upstairs. The eight-arm stew didn't, didn't look too good, but taste was something else. It was scrumptious, my mother said with her mouth. Well, what is it? Chef's secret, said Scooter. He never tells what's in it after we've e until we've eaten. I wasn't interested in what was in the stew. I looked at everyone. So Scooter's moving in? He's not going to leave ever? Is that it? My dad nodded. That's it. If he can stand you two. My mom turned to Scooter. I waited till we got to... I waited till... I waited till we got here to tell you this. Dear Abby is now a vegetarian. Scooter Winston blessed himself. He's not a Catholic, but he does that when he feels unsafe. Since when? He said, as if he was saying, when did she die? It's been going on several weeks now. Does she count fish as meat? She counts anything that has a face. Scooter nodded slowly. I guess that includes mice then. My mother stared at him. He was grinning and looking at her plate of stew. Her eyes bulged and she squawked. She jerked around to look into the kitchen. The trap was still there. A little glob of peanut butter as bait. Scooter chewed yummily on a forkful of stew. I always like to make use of the local livestock. My mother wagged her fork at him. I wouldn't put it past you. I really would not. We all laughed. Anyway, my mom said, it would take more than eating a mouse to spoil this day for me. How's that, I said. She sipped on her coffee. Well, you know about that new mall that's coming? And you know my company is in real, a real estate agent for it. But what you don't know, and what I didn't know until this afternoon, is that yours truly is the last senior member of the team will be getting a piece of the action. I'm going to handle three of the small stores. She smiled from ear to ear. I couldn't remember seeing her look so proud. We all clapped. She took a shy bow. Does this mean we'll be rich, I said. She gave a grinny little snort. <laughs> Only thing means for sure is that I'll have more work. I kept staring at her. 
She looked away. The silence got longer. I was awesome today, I said. My dad smacked the table. Ah, I forgot your game. How'd it go? Who won? How'd you do? Suddenly, I didn't really feel like telling them. And I chewed on some stew and I shrugged. I scored six touchdowns. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw my father's jaw drop. I looked at the ceiling. I had never noticed how pure white the light was. A school record, said Scooter. My mother's voice came cracking low. Crash, that's wonderful. I'm really proud. I took a deep breath. I wanted to leave. Abby came in. She screamed when she saw Scooter and ran to him. It was complicated hugging him because she carried a big white cardboard sign tacked onto a three-foot stick. What's this, said Scooter, drawing back and almost getting clobbered. Abby turned the sign around so we could all see. It was painted in big red letters. It said, The Mall Must Fall. She wore a button that said the same thing. My mother cleared her throat. Uh, what's this about? Abby marched around the dining room table. We're going to demonstrate against the new mall, and we're not going to let them build it. Chapter 20. Abby and I fought over who got to carry Scooter's suitcase up to his room. I won. As usual, when he came to his picture in the hallway gallery, we had to stop and say, Now there's a handsome young man. I wonder who that is. The painting shows this sailor with his white hat cocked down to his eyebrow with his mouth open like he's saying something. If it wasn't hanging in our hallway, I would never have guessed it was my grandfather. The sailor is so young. My mother told us it was the first portrait she ever did. She was still in high school. He knocked on the wall. Nice bulkhead, too. We groaned, which is what he wanted. It's Navy talk. A bulkhead is a wall. A door is a hatch. The kitchen is the galley. The dining room is a mess. A stairway is a ladder. We dragged him away from the bulkhead to his room. It was the guest room, actually. But when we turned the light on and walked in, it had the warmest feeling, knowing he'd be there for good. I put his suitcase on the bed. Guess this isn't a guest room anymore, I said. The three of us looked at each other and broke out into giggles. Scooter started unpacking. Abby said, aren't you going to miss the ocean? Since he retired, Scooter has been living in a rooming house on Cape May in New Jersey. He said he wanted to be able to see the ocean every day. He took out a stack of boxer shorts, shorts with red and blue anchors on them. Sure, he said, but I start feeling that way. I'll just fill up the bathtub. Before he could stop her, Abby snatched a top pair of shorts and pulled them on over her jeans. She checked herself in the mirror. Oh, Scooter, can I have these? Please, please, just one pair. Scooter looked at me like he'd just seen an oyster from outer space. I shrugged. Fifth grade girls. Abby crouched, pleading in front of him. Pretty please, pretty please with sugar. Scooter just blinked. He still wasn't connecting. See what your mother says. Abby squealed and gave us a fashion show. I asked Scooter, what about your sea chest? The sea chest is a trunk filled with stuff he picked up from all over the world. A wooden mask from Africa. A silk robe from Japan. We would go rummaging through the chest whenever we visited him in Cape May. He held up a key. I put it in storage. Aren't you bringing it with you, I asked him. He took out... He took out our school pictures, the big ones with frames. This is the important stuff. And he put them on a dresser. Later, the three of us were sitting on Scooter's bed. This is something that goes way back to when Abby and I were little. We would climb into his bed in our pajamas. It would be dark outside, and the only light would be from the hallway. And Scooter would tell us stories. Not cuddle your teddy bear stories, but screamer stories, tremble stories, sink your teeth into your teddy bear stories. My parents know what's going on, so they don't call the police when they hear their kids screaming bloody murder. And I mean to tell you, when he says he's in the jungle on a moonless night, or in the back alleys of old Hong Kong, or in a salt swamp infested with sea crocs, well, you are there with him. And when he tells you to check the vine, you feel you feel in your leg, and you look to see it's not a vine, but it's a 30-foot anaconda ready, already coiled three times around your leg. Well, you gulp and you shriek, and you might even grab your little sister for dear life. When we're good and quaking under the covers, Scooter will finish up with some lighter stuff, like it's dessert. Sometimes he'll tell us about the foot hunters of Borneo instead of the head hunters, get it? Or how he went how they go around lopping off people's feet and shrink them to wear them around their necks.
And always he tells us about his pet, Ollie, the one-armed octopus. He found Ollie one day while scuba diving off the coast of Greece. At first, he thought he was looking at some kind of pregnant sea snake or a constipated eel. When he realized he had it up backwards, it was an octopus with seven of its legs chewed off in a fight or something. Scooter hoped he would never meet, meet up with himself. The octopus was flopped and all forlorn on the bottom of the sand, trying to pry open a scallop. Its head was the size of a softball, and its one tentacle was less than two feet long. Scooter took it back up to the ship, named it Ollie, and for years took it almost everywhere he went in a bucket of seawater. This time, Scooter told us about the day he worked in a carnival sideshow, with Ollie as the world's biggest sea worm. When Scooter finished, we just sat there soaking up all the good times. Abby piped, We can do this every night now, forever! Scooter pretended to swoon. Scooter, she said, then hesitated. She was thinking hard. Scooter? He leaned back against the headboard with a contented smile. Mm-hmm. She hesitated some more. I knew what was happening. We both grew up thinking Scooter's bed was the safest place in the world, like a boat in a sea full of crocodiles. In fact, we used to call it our bed boat. It was a place where you could say things out loud that you might only think elsewhere. I remember months when I was little. I had a big confession to make about something I'd done. I waited for a week so Scooter showed up, and I grabbed him in the driveway and dragged him up to the bed, whipped on my pajamas, and I couldn't wait till dark, and I confessed. Whatever Abby wanted to say, we were probably the first people to hear it. Okay, I'll stop there. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed.